Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Story of a Storyteller and my guest today is Andrew Shanahan. How are you, Andrew? Very good, thanks, Connor. How are you? I'm, I'm good. Can I check, is it Andrew or is it Andy? Oh, never Andy. No. Never Andy, right. I don't care. Call me whatever you want, but Andy's just, Andy's a very particular flavour, isn't it? There's, there's yeah. some people who lean heavily into Andy and I'm not one of them. But that, that's okay. I just won't call you that then. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I'm jocular enough. I don't think I'm popular enough to be an Andy. Like, you know, Andy McNabb, there's a guy, you know, who you'd trust and who... Yeah. Andrew, you know. <laughs> well, we'll leave it at Andrew. That's okay. <laughs> um, Andrew, for anyone watching and listening, is the author of Before and After, um, a, a kind of apocalyptic novel that we'll discuss later on, as well as the founder of Man... Is it, would you say man v fat or man versus fat? What do you call it? Yeah, uh, people say either. I, I would say man v fat. But okay, it's... well, we'll call it man v fat and I'll call you Andrew and I won't make any <laughs> naming mistakes. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get into, into both of them because they're, they're, they're interlinked and they're very interesting. So we'll get into that in a minute. But um, like before we get into that, I'd like to kind of give us a bit of background of you growing up and how you became this person that had so many different skills and jobs and everything. Okay, sure. Um, so my background as such, um, I grew up in the Midlands. I was born in Stafford, a uh, little village, little city in the not city, I think, I think it's a town in the Midlands. Uh, and we, we moved a little bit around there. So, um, and then I went to school in Stoke and went to the university in Manchester. And really, it was sort of a relatively typical upbringing, I would say. I don't think there's anything un uh, necessarily uh, noteworthy about my, my childhood as such. But uh, I certainly books were a, a huge part of who I was and uh, how I learned. Um, we were talking about just briefly before we, we started this interview about 2000 AD yeah. and I sort of uh, in a rather glib way said I think 2000 AD might have taught me to read and I think that, that there is some truth in that in that um, it was one of those moments in your reading career where you actually realise that stories have different levels yeah. so you know I think I'd always read 2000 AD never quite understanding that it was a satire of, of authoritarianism and and how you know Judge Dredd wasn't necessarily the perfect hero that I thought he was on first reading and that actually there was something terrifying about him as well mm -hmm. and I think that some of the authors who took Judge Dredd on really brought that out in the most magnificent way because on you know from cell to cell you're either cheering him or fearing him and thinking goodness me what a, a horrific future there is in mega city one yeah. um for waiting there for us so i think that you know that that for me was a really formative reading experience because the scales fell from my eyes and i was aware that, that there was there was depths in books and then you go back once that's been revealed to you once you go back and you go yeah you know what? i don't think animal farm was about people about animals all sitting around <laughs> at the trough i think there might have been something deeper there yeah he yeah, had maybe uh, yeah. <laughs> um yeah and i think i think as well it's 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 always interesting when when like everyone has that moment it's very similar to the moment when you realize mm -hmm. your parents are not perfect that they're human that they make mistakes Do you know it, it's like you then go oh wait and you, you you reflect and you think of all the books you've read and you think of all the comics you've read and everything and you kind of yeah you you, you read everything again almost don't you yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, that those two worlds obviously interlink when, when you realise that, that there are these depths. And I certainly, you know, I was a terrible, terrible student. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I was I was deeply annoying, I'm sure, because, you know, I always used to get really good grades, but um, never really did any work. And I think when I look back on that now, it's with a sense of shame of the fact that what a wasted opportunity that I could be so much smarter and, and know so much more. But actually, what I realised I was doing around things was that I was reading nonstop. Um, you know, I was I would read often off the reading lists that were 
provided for GCSEs, A levels, and courses. But I didn't stop reading, so I had a a, a very sort of broad um, knowledge base to draw from to to answer questions and things. And yeah, that reading is a fundamental part of of who I am and shaped me massively. So if you're saying it shaped you massively, I mean, obviously 2000 AD, do you think there's one book from, we'd say before you went to university, like either secondary school or primary school or even before, is there any one book that you can go like, that book shaped me, that book, there's something about that book that got to me? Oh man, one book, that's painful. Um, but maybe not the, one, maybe not one, but is, is, is there even one um, broad lesson you got from a multiple books that kind of, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, at the same time as kind of reading wide, wild, widely, I was also deeply pretentious in, <laughs> as a person and from what I read. So I often read books that made me look far smarter than I either was or felt. Okay. And so uh, I remember touting around uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by R.M. Persig at various points because it seemed like the sort of thing that was pretty cool and and you know struggled through reading it and and kind of got something out of it I did actually read it but um you know it, it was just that sense of reading for the sake of look at look at what I'm reading see yeah. the Kindle's rugged all of this because you know what's the point of reading all these pretentious books if you can't if show off all the covers exactly yeah. <laughs> it's what I'm doing right now <laughs> How are you supposed to impress people on the bus when you know your Kindle looks as utilitarian as everyone else's? Um, you just have to talk into a mobile phone even louder and say, you'll have to excuse me, I'm reading R.M. Persig, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> You're really reminding end. me of me when I was 16. <laughs> I think we were all this awful. Yeah, just... yeah. For me, for me, my Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance was uh, Clockwork Orange. That, that, that was my book that I was yeah. like... Look, look how amazing I am. I'm reading Clockwork yeah. Orange. And... I read that on the train back from uh, my granddad's funeral. And I remember the, the man in, in the, on the table opposite me going, you're very young to be reading Clockwork Orange. And me sort of preening and going, yes, I probably am. I'm probably a genius. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> or, or the classic, well, I'm very mature for my age. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you mind? I'm 48. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, Zen the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, just for the sheer sort of pretension of it. But the the kind of one that I think, um, I was really into William Burroughs for a long time, so um, Naked Lunch, but also a lot of his letters. I, I really preferred, um, he did a, a published book of his letters. And that really made an impact on me because it, it spoke about the writer's life and about what writing was like. And I had these sort of great ideas about what writing was like. And Burroughs was really quite brutal in his honesty around how poor he was, how uh, miserable he was. I mean, you know, he had endless um, sex and drugs. So he seemed like he was living a life, but he was, he was just, you know, he had to keep moving to shittier and shittier countries because uh, he was just so poor, <laughs> basically. Um, and then, you know, he things poor came when it came to money, but I mean, he, he was rich in other ways. It seems. Yes. Yeah. In, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was really, and uh, Hunter S. Thompson, for similar reasons, you know, I, I really enjoyed his letters, possibly more than I enjoyed his novels. Um, and uh, On the Road by Jack Kerouac. That was just another book that that really stuck with me. And probably the one that, that shaped me personally um, in terms of my own style was Of Mice and Man by wow. Steinbeck. Um, just because I, I love that relationship um, and that, that sort of that fraternal style relationship, which was something I think that I think I, I felt like I lacked. Um, and But it was, it really resonated with me, this sort of, that the strength and the beauty of that relationship. I think, you know, and probably more than any book that destroys me, you know, even if I see it replicated in Bugs Bunny cartoons these days, you know, where you see it, it parodied, it still makes me cry. It's awful. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking, speaking just as you were saying earlier about the, the, 
scales falling from your eyes and looking back. Jeez, those Looney Tunes cartoons, like Bugs Bunny, Dad, they, they, they had some fantastic references that, uh, and, yeah. music and operatic music as well that just, as a kid, when you're watching it going, ha ha, you hit him in the head. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they were hitting you on the head with classical references to really important stuff. You know? All the way through, exactly, yeah. And um, so it's quite funny because I've got a three-year-old daughter, I've got two sons as well, and a three-year-old daughter. And we watch Tom and Jerry and... I think it's really interesting, you know, you can probably see where you are on the cynicism circle, cycle, about how you relate to Tom and Jerry, because yeah. obviously you watch it as a kid and it's just really funny. Jerry, you're rooting for Jerry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and then, then you go through the phase, yeah, where you're going, man, Tom has it really tough. <laughs> Sympathising with him and thinking, yeah, it would, why, you know, there's thousands of mice. If he could just eat Jerry once and you know hoping for it and now i just i'm i'm back in the kind of the um the slapstick just kills me yeah just seeing like you know tom hit into a, a big sort of bowl of bubble gum and his eyes going different colors because of the different bubble it's just oh man sublime <laughs> so I, I think I, but i'm waiting for my my second teenagerhood really in in probably my late 40s early 50s where i'll start going oh, how, how repulsive slapstick how, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. So, so you you seem to have a big uh, a gr- sorry, I was going to say an Irish word, a grow, a love, um, for stories of all kinds, maybe comic books or slapstick cartoons and all the books you've read. So, when you were younger, like, did you ever were you ever into telling stories and writing your own, or is that something that just came after your career in journalism? Uh, first of all, I need you to. Uh, spell the word grow for me oh okay it's uh well it has a letter that doesn't exist in english so <laughs> uh g r and then a father which is an a but with a little flick on the top a father a father grow and grow is love it's it's one of the loves there's loads of there's like multiple multiple words so like grow is um if you have a grow for something it's uh you, you're you're passionate and you care about it um yeah and, like a burning yeah, and you can you can see you see we don't even say you can you can say Tom and Raw that which is I'm I'm in love with you, but that would be more a lust kind of a, a love, whereas it's even Lum who would be the kind of more nurturing kind of caring love. And anyway, this this suddenly becomes an Irish uh, topic, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it's um, no bad thing. It's no bad yeah. thing. It's fascinating. Um, so. Cruel. Thank you. That's a great word. Um, for me, stories, I think, um, yeah, th- I remember writing from a very early age and, you know, um, wanting to, to reshape the world through my experience and my experiences of the world through what I wrote down. And yeah, I, I think I was just always that way inclined, you know, um, I don't it's, it's difficult to say whether you think that can you can you make a writer or is is there just that natural tendency to write and I think for me it was always just a love of words and you know um e- even now when, when I hear interesting fascinating words it's it's I want to know them and I want to, yeah. to soak them up so that because when you have a a developed vocabulary and you have an ability to to wield that I don't think there's anything more I don't think there's anything sexier I don't think there's anything more powerful I don't think there's anything more wonderful to see than someone with a rich command of their language yeah using it to its fullest extent it's devastating it can be you know it can result in absolute hilarity it can result in sheer brutality um but it's it's always just a joy to watch and I think from, for me, um, I think the first time I remember writing a story was when we used to go up and see my grandparents in Edinburgh. And, you know, for, for a kid, when you're driving on the motorway, it's it's just endless. And yes. so um, even, and as you look at the beautiful hills out the window, uh, but, uh, yeah. Um, the hills back home. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Marginally bigger, great. Um, <laughs> 
And so just through that sheer boredom and, and wanting to write. So I remember just filling up um, exercise book after exercise book and, and thinking that was wonderful. And I, I think I'd, I was always like that. I kept diaries when I was a teenager, which were obviously read by parents and things like that. Um, and it was just a, a natural instinct in me to, to put things down, to try and write and to try and express myself in that way. And I think it's partly because <clears throat> I often felt more fluent in, in the written form. You know, I like talking to people. I like expressing myself verbally, but I feel like you can reach the, some people, you know, you listen to Stephen Fry, Will Self, people like that, um, and they can express themselves absolutely pinpoint accuracy yeah. as they're talking. And that's amazing. That's just, a, you know, what a skill. But I, I feel like I can only come near to that level of fluency and that uh, articulacy when I'm writing because I need to stop. I need to check the reference, which I would have casually just thrown off the top of my head and then, you know, 40 minutes later realize it wasn't Steinbeck. It was actually, you know, <laughs> it was all well or something. And so I, I feel like that's where I have my confidence in writing. If I can sit and create a piece of written work and also, you know, you can shave away the, the, the bits that you don't want and the bits that don't. After having been a journalist, I've been a journalist for over 20 years. Yeah. And through doing that, through a daily process of, um, writing and shaping words and getting things in on time and then being shouted at for you know the weakness of your language and the possible legal implications of your uh, rusty you know um, links and things like that um, it's you learn to to shape language and that's where I feel most comfortable is in sitting in front of a computer and writing a passage of text yeah yeah um seeing as you mentioned the the your work in journalism um and i I, th I think it's a good point because i think now in uh like we're recording this november uh, 2020 and um with trumpism in in the in the in the us and you have brexit as well over in your your part of the world in the uk i mean it just shows the power of using particular of uh, like it shows the power of journalism whether for ill or for good I think, and um, we, we won't get too much into Brexit and Trump because God knows that could, <laughs> that could be 10 episodes of a podcast. I might get you back on maybe, who knows? Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I think you're right. And I think language is, is so, it's so important to have the right words. And you, you reminded me as well of my, uh, I'm, a, I'm a primary teacher and in uh, a child psychology lecture, um, uh, there was a there was a man what was his name Mark Morgan was a lecturer and he said that above all the subjects that we teach in school in Ireland um, English was the most important because if a child doesn't have the language to express themselves properly then they can't and then if they can't that leads to psychological issues you know further down the line um, which seeing as you mentioned Orwell is the whole point of 1984 to if they they have edited out so many words like there's no such thing as brilliant it's double plus good it's it's to suppress people and all that kind of thing so um yeah yeah and that's, it's about the, the control isn't it that you can exert yeah. through language and i, I think the, the other thing you know just pulling in the, the the point of trumpism as well is that you know the the thing that we we've grown inured to in many ways is that language is magic and the the expression of language is is the, the fundamental essence of magic so you know in the in the fantasy world magic is when a wizard uses or you know a sorcerer uses a spell to a set of words which then have an impact on the world yeah. so it might be that their spell is you know to cast a fireball or something like that so okay so we don't have those direct sources of language although i would argue through computer language we do have those sorts of things you know through computer language i won't do it because it'll actually switch this off but you know if i if i ask my uh, assistant my yes. uh, google assistant to do something for me in the room you know if I, I want it to switch on my light bulb then it will do that 
So I would argue that through language and through computer language, we've created a situation where we can have this incredibly direct impact on our world, but also through a, a broader sense as well, if we want people to experience things. So I think I said before about the fact that if you want people to laugh or if you want people to cry or if you want people to change their mind, the way that we can do that is through the eloquent expression of language. Yeah. So how how is that not magic? Yeah. I just you know don't see the difference between the two other than that one uses you know nonsense often latin-esque phrases <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> um so how, how did you how did you get started in journalism like was it was it something you went straight into after university or was it kind of something you stumbled into it was something I stumbled into, really, because during university, I wrote for the student newspaper. Actually, uh, as is typical for me, I came to it very late. It was just after I graduated that I, I started writing for the student newspaper. Oh, which course. sounds very, Yeah, it sounds kind of weird because obviously you should be a student, but I think they wanted to do a series about people who just graduated. And so um, I started writing for the, the student newspaper and just really found it thrilling to have something that you wrote uh, you know, you could occasionally see people, this was in the days of far more printed media, obviously, but the, mm. you know, you could see people on the bus reading the student newspaper and they turn over and see your column and then flip past it, obviously. But, um, you know, <laughs> they have briefly... There. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. There was still that subliminal moment where they could have impacted, you could have impacted on them. And it was just, it was really um, a eureka moment for me, really, that this was... An immediate way for me I, I knew that I wanted to write fiction ultimately but I think I I was very aware that that was a a tough slog um whereas writing f for the newspapers and writing for magazines was a a way that you could get paid and b a way that you could very quickly learn to to write on a you know it, it's becoming a professional writer so if nothing else, I believe that I'm a professional writer, someone who can respond to a brief and, you know, turn in 2000 words tomorrow on pretty much any subject that you care to, to give me. And, and that was really what, what taught me. So from there, I, I started working for a publishing company in Manchester who did a lot of magazines and um, products for graduates and students. So if you ever went into your careers, library or careers office while you're at university then all of the publications and the magazines that they did there were from a company called graduate prospects and that's the company that i worked for and they were really, really good at uh, developing they had you know uh, they published an awful lot of magazines and so they needed journalists and editors so i started as an editor and as a journalist well as a journalist but also functioned as an editor on some of the other publications and that was a really, really valuable learning experience because not only was I churning out my own copy, I was also reading other people. Yeah, I was going to say, you're kind of, you're getting both sides of it, aren't you? Because not only are you doing your own, you're also correcting others. So there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's something I keep saying uh, that I, I'm in a writing group and we meet once a month and I learn 70% of what I learned from that group is reading other people's stuff and seeing, yeah. oh, wow, there's, there's something. Do I make that same do I have that same issue or do I make that same mistake in my own writing? And it kind of yeah, that. yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, it, it's formative. It's, you know, it's, it's so useful. And for anyone who, uh, you know, younger people who are potentially looking at, at writing, who are listening to this, absolutely get yourself into a situation where you can correct other people's work. And, and funnily enough, you know, that there's an awful lot of work out there for it at the moment, because, if you offer work as a proofreader, often uh, you know people are more than happy to, to have you proofread their work. Mm. And it gives you that experience of, of going into a, a malleable page of text with someone else's work and shaping it and seeing what happens if you pull out that paragraph and if you pull that out. And I think probably, arguably, my, my skills are greater in terms of editing and rewriting than they possibly are in writing. So, okay. you know, I, I feel 
very confident when it comes to having a block of text and, and being able to shape that. Um, and I, I'm still assailed by doubt and worry <laughs> when it comes to actually putting that text onto the page. Aren't we all? <laughs> so, so <laughs> uh, There's one, one tiny thing you mentioned on your, um, on your profile on your Amazon author page that I, I just have to get more info on. <laughs> said. I know what this is about. I'm really, you know what's coming, but people listen. Yeah. Um, so you said you wrote an article or something about which injury hurts the most. An article for a children's science magazine, which received more complaints than any article did ever run. So, yeah. huh? What? Why? <laughs> Tell more. So what it was, was that there was this great um, children's science magazine that used to be available in news agents before news agents stopped selling magazines and, and you know, it being a profitable business model. But it was, it was a really cool magazine because basically what you realize when you you write for this I, i'm not a science specialist but you know it was for children so therefore i'm smarter than kids broadly speaking um so therefore i was qualified <laughs> and it was amazing yeah exactly yeah. um it was really cool because you you got to you realized what it was that your readership wanted and what children want is just the grossest, bleakest, yeah. darkest, snottiest. You're a primary school teacher, so you get this every single day. I mean, there's a reason um, Horrible Histories, I'm sure you know that series of books, like yeah. they skyrocketed in sales when they first came out in the 90s because it did have all the gross things. And yeah, it, it's for that reason. But anyway, sorry. And also, you know, I think there's that sort of slightly Victorian um, sensibility about protecting children through not telling them about death and about what happens when you know uh, but but kids love that stuff oh yeah you know as long as and as long as you talk to them about it in a moderated and open way where they can ask questions and process things often the questions that they will ask are pretty bleak um and and it takes you to difficult places because you, you sort of you're working off your instincts of, I didn't think this was a child-friendly conversation. But actually, all conversations are child-friendly conversations, provided you have them in, in a sensible enough way. Um, so there's your, sorry to cut across you, but there, there's your point about language and the strength and the, the ability of it, because I, I agree with you. I think maybe not every conversation is child-friendly, but every topic can be child-friendly. And you just mm. have to use the correct language that both teaches or explains that topic, but at the same time doesn't overwhelm them or introduce them to concepts they're not ready for. So it's all about using the correct I language. I think that's true. But then, I mean, you, you're sort of aware that, you know, child abuse is a thing that happens in this world. And I'm not saying that, you know, all conversations are about child abuse, but so therefore that being the case, you ha you realize that you have to have that conversation with some children. Yeah. Because otherwise, what, how on earth do you help them process that sort of reality? Um, you know, so when the world thrusts horrific adult concepts onto children, like, you know, death, poverty, hunger, um, you know, abuse, those are things that children do experience mm. and experience in far, far greater numbers than we would ever be comfortable admitting. And I think that when you see that, you realise that actually, well, children need support in those conversations and you know clearly you wouldn't just go in and start talking about those things yeah. but I think we have to be open to the fact that the world often throws some pretty horrific things at kids and therefore we have to to acknowledge that and maybe you know to some extent things like horrible histories is closer to acknowledging those sorts of things um than than we would often like to admit um, and so this this particular magazine Really oh, yeah. so get back to what my actual <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, just skip back to We're that. both at fault. <laughs> <laughs> the you know, from um that was a really instructive thing to to have a readership like that and to to see what it was. So I wrote a thing about um when dogs kill themselves. <laughs> because and, and that was based off a question from, from one of the readers. Do dogs ever kill themselves? Oh, and they're like, oh, man, that's a great question. Do they? Yeah. <laughs> so I went and, uh, and yeah, they do occasionally. Um, not not sort of knowingly, but anyway. Yeah. Um, and there's a bridge in Scotland where 
more dogs have plummeted to their death than anywhere else on earth. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but this particular article was about what what hurts the most. Okay. And so this was something I pitched, which was, you know, kids love injuries and accidents and things like that. And, and so as a result, I spoke to a number of different medical professionals from neurologists, um, A&E doctors, uh, you know, all sorts of, of people and asked them, you know, in your professional opinion, what hurts the most? Mm. And they all came back with these really gross things like, well, inf inflamed kidney stones and you know, all these things. But this A&E doctor won because he said that, um, I can't remember if he'd, he'd actually treated him or it was someone that he knew had treated him. So uh, I, I hope it never proves apocryphal, but he said um, it was a rugby player who fell badly during a tackle. And as he fell badly, he dislocated his hip. Ooh, painful, right? No. Not even the start of it. So the first aider comes on and relocates his hip, feeling like, you know, he's doing him a favour. And the guy starts screaming even more as he's relocated his hip. And he says, why, what, what's, you know, they, they try and work out what's going on. And this guy, he's screaming so much, he bursts his vocal cords. So he's just sort of like, ah, 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 not even making any Gosh. noise as he's screaming. <laughs> and what they realised was that they trapped his testicular nerve into the ball and socket. <laughs> <laughs> and it sort of clunked back in. Oh, his God. testicular nerve is in there. And so so when he even that's not even the end of it, is it? Because when he gets to hospital and they figure that out, they've got to pull his bloody leg out again. <laughs> I know. There's not enough morphine in the world, really, is there? I I I, I need morphine now. <laughs> Holy oh wow that's, yeah that's, that's so you've put that in a kids magazine then <laughs> yeah and they got loads of complaints <laughs> <laughs> go figure well i mean you answered yeah. the question I, it was like what else are you supposed to do you know exactly i'm a reporter i i don't make it up i just tell people what people have told me <laughs> um so as you're a journalist i sorry i need to move on because that that that's <laughs> That's scaring me. Um, anyway, <laughs> I, as you're working in journalist, I know you, you ended up uh, being a food writer and being a restaurant critic. And then yep. over time, that kind of de developed and affected you physically. Um, yeah. So, I mean, from um, working as a food writer was, was just a real privilege. And it was a very... Um, interesting view into a, a sort of a, a field of life that I'd never necessarily seen before so uh, you know I'd never eaten a, a Michelin star restaurant before I started working as, as a food writer and it was really really fascinating to see how quickly your standards and your expectations rise to that level That's of skyrocket yeah yeah exactly yeah so then you're walking into your local harvester going oh god not even doing a crumb sweep, <laughs> yeah. you become this this absolute monster. Um, it does actually change the way that you you enjoy eating out because it becomes you you find yourself. So I was the um, a restaurant critic for the Metro. Um, I reviewed for the AA Guide and for um, a number of different places. I won a competition for best young restaurant critic and things like that. And so it was it was a really fun thing to do. I always came at it from the point of view of I have no experience of this because my, my broad general view was that 70, 80 percent of the country have probably never set foot in a Michelin star restaurant before. Yeah. And actually, a, a good proportion of those people are probably terrified of doing so because God alone knows that I was. Um, and so I just and, and one thing I've never been frightened of is just wearing my idiocy. Um, as a sort of shield and going in and asking stupid questions and not really caring if people went who's that twat you know um, it's just sort of part of the course so that was really good the the obvious consequence of people inviting you out to eat and to uh, drink 
was that I ate and drank a lot and got incredibly fat as a result. And my weight had, had always fluctuated and has always fluctuated through, through my life. And it was, I think, you know, during that period, I was probably four or five stone heavier than I am now. So I was probably about 18, 19 stone. Um, okay. And, you know, just desperately unhappy with, with where I was. And there was a lot of things going on at the time. So I'd started a business um, supporting men who were getting married. So I did, um, we did a lot of writing about wedding speeches and uh, best men, father of the bride, that sort of thing. And I just sold that business and was, I was working stupidly long hours. I was stressed and I was pretty miserable in, in truth because I was just sort of consumed by work. And I'd really let my, my sort of weight balloon. And it was really difficult for me at that point because I wanted to lose weight and just didn't feel like there was any support out there, really. Okay. And that's, that's, that's what ended up becoming man versus fat because you, you, I, I was reading on the about page of that that you kind of went to, you, you went to explore losing your weight and becoming healthier but that most of the things out there were, I, w- would you say it's fair to say they're aimed at women or it's just that it was mostly women that went to these things? What, what do you think it is? Like I'm talking the likes of Weight Watchers, Slimming World, you know. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. It's sort of a chicken and egg question in some ways. Is it, was it targeted at women and therefore only women went? I think it's probably broadly true because if you look back to the formation of some of the earlier organizations like Weight Watchers you know they were sold and marketed through almost like Tupperware party style um, deals in the 1960s in America where it was you know the women got together to talk and to, to have social interaction but the kind of the the purpose or the, the meta purpose of that that meeting was weight. Mm. And so people who felt that they needed to lose weight. And, and clearly these were operated, you know, we're talking back in the 1960s where men were away at work. And you could almost see that these were, that was a divergent point for culture because mm. this was where weight, fat, the diet industry became a, a female entity it became a feminine um issue and so you know you could even say of... even weight and dieting and, and that kind of thing even started in the 60s because up until then i mean like <clears> back <throat> the 50s people were just recovering from world war ii and sure. world war II, you know like I, there were definitely people that had weight issues in those eight times but not to the extent that there is now or you know so i'd say it's kind of a thing of it both started in the 60s and also started aiming at women in the 60s, you can really say. Undoubtedly, yeah. And I think that's a really interesting sociological point about the fact that, you know, from the in the 1960s and the 1970s, fat was almost sort of like this, this sort of um, almost a point of pride in some ways. Yeah. Because if you go back to a very short period before, so the 1950s, 1940s, so where the, these people's parents would have been influencing them, you know, the fat wasn't an option, it, you know, yeah. that we, they worked in, in primarily manual jobs or jobs that were required them to be on their feet. They, uh, car use was so much lower. So walking and cycling was so much more prevalent and the abundance of calorie rich food just wasn't there. So yeah, as you go into the 60s and 70s, it, it almost wasn't a shameful, oh gosh, I'm so fat sort of issue. Yeah. It was, oh yeah, I could stand to lose a few pounds, check me out sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't ever that overt, but I think that there was definitely that sort of that issue. And so, you know, you fast forward through the, the, the decades and you can see why weight and fat um, skipped men yeah. and why it's codified in many different ways for men as almost being a positive mm-hmm. so you, you had these situations where you know there were hollywood st- stars 
who were male who were larger. Yeah. And yes, you know, some of them were in comic roles, but not all of them. Yeah. Um, you know, and so there were still these people who men could identify with. And, and still to this day, you know, we have people joining up with Man Be Fat who say, I don't want to become thin because thin is seen as weak. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and actually we have just as many, well, we have a number of men who come to us and say, actually, my battle with weight is putting it on. Because men who genetically are, are often quite thin f- sometimes feel dreadful about that because they feel that that leaves them weaker and less important and that they're, they're pilloried for that. I mean, God, what a world. Um, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, no it, it's you're, you're either you don't have enough weight or you're too much of it. And that's that seems to be the, the line in the sand, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and it's, you know. But I think through my own experience of, of kind of feeling really, really miserable with my weight. So Man V Fat started in 2014 when I, I kind of started to lose weight. And I've said this a few times, but genuinely, this is a true story. I, was, I went to Weight Watchers and was the sole bloke lurking in the back of the class, in my, you know, a total freak. And um, it, in this particular class, the, the leader said, I mean, we talk about, um, you know, your weight during your period and, you know, how it can fluctuate. And mm-hmm. so don't worry, girls, if you're kind of a pound on, a pound off during your, your you know, if you're menstruating. I was like, that just isn't my problem. You like, um, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> Why is my weight fluctuating? <laughs> <laughs> I get my period, I'm going to hospital. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's just that sense of... Um, that they weren't covering the topics that I knew were important for men, uh, which were, you know, I was working far, far too long hours. I was, you know, that meant that at points I was having to eat from service stations and there was no healthy food there. What do you eat if you're going to go to a service station and eat healthy? You know, there's a question. Um, and there are all these sorts of things where, and how do I fight against the fact that my mates, if I tell them I'm on a diet, they're going to say, come on, come for a curry, yeah. fat arsehole, come on, it doesn't matter, let's go for a pint. Um, and, you know, the role of alcohol in men's lives, those sorts of things. You know, so it felt to me like weight needed a gendered answer mm. because you needed to be able to say, and also the other thing as well is that men are very, very, find it difficult if they are in mixed uh, gender groups when it comes to weight loss. So that it's difficult because some of them clam up and don't want to talk about the things that they found difficult. Um, and so when we started Man Be Fat, there was just this real rush of agreement that this was something that needed to, you know, to exist. Yeah. And, and I'd started the crowdfunding campaign on the lines of, is it just me who feels this way? And we had 3000 guys who signed up in uh, the period of that, um crowdfunding campaign it got shared by things that people like jamie oliver and the british obesity society and there just seemed to be this real upswell of support for it as a a, a, something that needed to exist and Mm -hmm. very fortunately um that that's never really stopped really i mean i say very fortunately but at the same time i wish that wasn't true it's one of those businesses that you really you wish that you could go out of business because ultimately um you know it's not a, a nice you set it up to... because there's an issue and you'd rather the yeah. issue wasn't there but totally. while it is there here's one <laughs> of the solutions and that's yeah. that's one thing I'm, I'm really interested in is you said you you, you look at man v fat as a gendered answer to to weight loss and I, 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 I know that there's some people out there that are listening and even there's a part of me that's going, no, 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 no. You can't have a, have a, a an exclusive thing gender wise, but it's, it's, I suppose from my understanding about man v fat isn't necessarily exclusive. It's more including those that were already excluded. It's, it's, which is weird for like, <laughs> for, for men to say, well, actually we're in this realm, we're the damn trodden ones. Um, <laughs> so yeah. What, what is it that man v fat does to gender weight loss? Like what, what is it? What, what are the kind of key things? Is it just even the fact that it's just a room of men talking about their weight or is there other steps and actions that you take? 
Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> there's a number of things, really. I think that I do still believe strongly that there needs to be a gendered approach to, to weight loss because I still believe that the, the different... So, I mean, you could go from a simple biological truth, which is that men carry more muscul- m- muscle than women biologically. Mm. So that is not a sort of controversial statement. That's just a biological truth. And as a result of that, men's metabolism tends to be higher. So if, if men start dieting, they tend to lose weight quicker than women. Yeah. And if you put all of those people in the same room, so if you put men and women in the same room and say you are on a weight loss journey together, often the men will outperform the women. If the, the men stay, you know, it, arguing that, you know, everyone, and, and does actually stay the course of the, the programme, men will nearly always outperform women because they will burn calories at a higher rate. Yeah. So even just that, let's say, for example, so Slimming World used to do this um, fruit basket per week for the biggest loser. So, you know, if the one bloke, Barry, at the back of the class, who's got, you know, is 19 stone, needs to be 14, he, if he's on it, he's going to win the fruit basket every week. And the women are going to hate him for the fact that he's taking them the fruit basket. And it's not the fact that, you know, it's just the fact that there is a difference between them. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, that's a quite a trite point, but it's, it's, it but shows. It's a very basic one. And not only that, I mean, if, if you are the only man in a swimming world class or weight in world class or weight, weight mm. watchers class or whatever, and yeah. you are losing it faster, apart from the fact that you're the only man there feeling ostracized and feeling different, if you're accelerating and causing feelings of jealousy amongst these people that are there with you, that's mm. going to make that worse. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and that actually points towards one of the things that we did to, to look at supporting men, which is the fact that men are often quite competitive. Um, so if you can harness that competitiveness and direct it towards weight loss in a healthy way, obviously, but you know, you can actually, do tremendous things so for i created this thing called man v fat football which is yeah, our I, foot- I read about this this is, i love this idea <laughs> <laughs> so there's um so what it is is for um football leagues for so small sided football leagues so f- um five six seven side uh football leagues exclusively for overweight and obese men and what happens is that all, all of the men weigh in before they play their game they're put into teams put into leagues like a normal sort of five-side football league to sort of set up but they weigh in beforehand and as a result of their weight loss per week they add goals to their team's performance that week mm. so we often have situations where teams will go out and get absolutely thrashed on the pitch but they will win because when you add in the weight loss goals yeah they've lost you know it's not just on the the amount of weight loss it's on things like consistency of weight loss so for example a player can score a hat trick by losing weight three weeks in a row okay it doesn't have to be you know a certain amount it just has to be a weight loss each week and you know again that's a way of gamifying and harnessing that psychological um approach that men sometimes have um, and also it, it made it a lot easier to market because men were saying to their mates, I'm joining this football league. And that didn't sound as weird as saying I'm joining this weight loss program. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the fact, but then it, because it was very overtly man v fat football, you know, it was about being fat. It was, it almost becomes this sort of source of, well, I'm joining it because I need to lose weight. You know, mm. we're not hiding that fact. It is, but what we are doing is that we are structurally creating this where it is you versus fact. So it's you versus this problem. Yeah. And the football is just sort of a, a fun sort way of to set. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think even, um, even, even the name Man V Fat, I think, I think it's, 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 it's cleverly named because it's very blunt. And, um, it, it, it just like Slimming World, Weight Watchers, they're, they're very kind of welcoming and calming and listen, don't worry, it's okay. Whereas, it's not even weight, it's not even Weight Watchers anymore. It's WW. 
uh, yeah, yeah, even that, like it's even kind of hiding, well, not hiding what it is, like everyone knows, but, and there's nothing wrong with that, because I do think there is, like, I mean, we're talking about the, the, the gender differences of, of weight problems, I think, um, like you were saying, men are kind of, don't want to get thin, but equally women are consistently, constantly barraged from a very young age about their appearance, with the weight yeah. being one of the things of the appearance, so you can kind of understand why, these programs are more welcoming for women with those names even just because it's yeah. less you're fat whereas with the men i think i think the word the, the verses in it is is key from from my understanding of it because it's oh right i'm gonna go bin, beat this thing i'm gonna go win i'm gonna da, 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 and yeah. gamifying it kind of taps into the sometimes <laughs> negative aspect of a lot of men of being very competitive <laughs> so yeah. it's yeah. no it's it's a uh, it's, it's very interesting because it's it's something that I have never really thought deeply about. And then no, sure. researching for this, I'm like, whoa, there's actually so much here. <laughs> yeah. And and I mean, I think the, the thing that I often thought when it came to Man V Fat was that, you know, people talk about uh, with businesses, what's your niche? Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, who, who's your audience for this? Well, you know, where's your niche? And you're like, and it's me- in the name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But, but for me, niche always implied like a, a narrow proportion of something. I mean, I'd have to look, get the dictionary to look at the exact meaning of it, but I'm sure it's a slice. It's a, you know, it's a, a kind of a part of a whole. And the thing that really struck me about Man Big Fat was how much of a problem weight is in our society. So, you know, you look at men, and, and I think you know, these figures might be a little bit outdated now, but it was around about 28 million men in the UK are either overweight or obese. And it's seven out of 10 men who are overweight or obese. And, you know, when you start thinking about that, you're thinking that's not the overwhelming majority of the market. Mm. a little bit you still there Connor yeah I was still there it's all right yeah. we can cut that out Technically. it's all right it's all right don't worry it's not your fault <laughs> so yeah for me that that was the real surprise was was seeing sort of how prevalent this was as a problem and and therefore and, and I don't think that that's still acknowledged fully from yeah. a society point of view, I think that we st- still think that weight is just this sort of funny little side issue. When it's not, it's it's something that, and you know, people yeah. experience that that problem to a, a greater or lesser degree. Um, you know, for me, it was a, a, a real problem and has been a lifelong um, yo-yoing battle. But equally, um, for, for some people, it's it's genuinely miserable, and that's kind of where before and after came out of. Yeah, and that's that's good. Look at look at this. You, you you know how to segue. Like you're doing all the, the segues for me. I kind of feel like I'm, I just sit back and let you go. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's what I wanted to ask. Because you're right, it is it is about the, the the fact that it's it's not really spoken about. And um, one thing that you you said in the um, when when we were first connecting about this was that before and after, which I'll, I'll get you to speak about it in a minute. The main character is. Um, Oh, I, I think it's safe to say obese, not overweight. <laughs> mm, yeah, absolutely. As you say, as you said, it's not just a cosmetic thing that's added in. It's it's actually integral to the story and the plot and the character's journey. So, can you tell us a bit about before and after? Yeah, sure. So, from a um, you know a blurb point of view, before and after is the story of Ben Stone, who weighs six hundred and one pounds. So, as you say, absolutely uh, obese, category three. I think that would be for the height that he's at and um he's diabetic he needs uh, an operation to amputate his leg and he's been a shut-in for nine years in his flat fourth floor flat in a uh, uh, block of flats and it, the book starts when the council comes to take the front of his flat off so that a crane can can take him out of his flat because he can't safely use the stairs or the, the lift and he's he's going to be craned out of his flat 
and he's, he's kind of wrapped up and you know made safe for this this journey and at that point the world ends and so it's the the story really starts when you know he, he's just on the verge of leaving the flat for the first time and you know in uh, a very 2020 way the story is primarily about someone who is stuck in his home mm. watching a pandemic rage outside his window and that is in a nutshell is what the book's about and it's it's such an interesting story because of course like it's something we've seen and heard a lot i don't say in the news but i I feel like there was a point in time like the late 90s to the mid to late 2000s where like it'd be an e4 or a channel 4 thing where there'd be this kind of documentary or investigative kind of report or something on someone like that on um Oh, sorry, what was the main character's first name again? Sorry, Ben Stone. Ben. Ben. So, like, on someone like Ben, that while they're so big and they're so obese, they actually have to be lifted by a crane or by <clears throat> production work kind of stuff. And yeah. it's something that has kind of faded from mainstream media a little bit. That particular type of obesity, and mm. it's interesting to see it come back in your book. Uh, mm. What was it? I mean, obviously, you had your you had Mandy Fat behind you at this stage when you were not behind you but like it was it was well and truly running at this stage so what was it apart from man man versus fat what was it that made you think of ben as a character and of how to put him in the situation you put him in i think the um there's a couple of things there the the, for me where did he come from the i'd had several conversations and i'd interviewed you know, over a thousand guys through doing Man V Fat who were losing weight or wanted to lose weight or had successfully lost weight. Mm. And I'd interviewed a number of of what are called shut-ins where people don't leave the house because of their weight. And often, you know, that's a combination of either physical, physically they can't leave the house because their mobility is severely restricted. Um, You know, obviously once you reach a weight of that sort of level, um, the danger is if you fall over, there is a really it's a problem to, to get back on your feet. And that often results in injury. So nervousness can, can result about sort of leaving the house. But often as well, there is there is real mental health problems um, associated with why they've gained that weight and, and where that has come from. Mm. And I think for me, you know it was such a those conversations were really difficult and they were really tragic and I felt that but I also really really saw and feel the the true humanity of those of of people because you know it's so easy to to look at someone who's overweight or obese and say just see them as that weight problem and you know that there are countless surveys and studies that show that People naturally think that people who are overweight are um, poorer, more stupid, um, of a lower socioeconomic group, yeah. um, less educated. You know, all of these things that the the assumptions that we make of oh, some negative assumptions as well, uh, hugely, yeah. And and as I say, you then go back to this idea that actually this is seventy percent of the male population yeah. who are overweight or obese. So. Where, why are we not seeing the other side of that, this sort of this more human side of things about men and weight? And so that struck me that it was a really, I think the original one line idea was what would happen to a shut in at the end of the world? Mm-hmm. And I think it was really just an extrapolation of that. Yeah, that's an interesting idea because, you know, often in post-apocalyptic novels, there's this great journey that they undertake from one side of the coast of America to the other to deliver. Yeah, it's always America, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, always. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this one is proudly set in Middleton in North Manchester. <laughs> and it's, you know, and I felt that that was missing a trick, really. And it, it was a useful um, story device to, to put this at the end of the world because we have expectations of what those stories include mm. and to put someone who is so profoundly not 
usually seen in a um an apocalyptic like story like that yeah. yeah it just it just struck me as a really interesting way and i think the um the british obesity society reviewed the book and were, were very kind about it and they they struck uh, the the nail on the head for me which is that they said that it was um you know it was a, a profound horror story and the worst part is that the you know so much of it is real and i think you know once you take away the the more dramatic elements of the end of the world um you know, a lot of the story of Ben is about his, um, you know, how he gained weight and and why he was in that situation and how he felt about his body. And I think that that is, is where a lot of the, the true horror comes in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure a lot of the, uh, the men that you've helped through Man V Fat really kind of, I'm sure that book resonated with them. And I'm sure there's other men and women, of course, that have read it and it resonates them with uh, at, at the start of their journey. So that that's something I think is really interesting about the book because it's like I said, like like the two of us were saying, it's it's not a we'll say it's not a physical character that you would see often in no. any book really. And if it is in a book, it's it's unfortunately usually for a comic relief or or, or it's something that isn't quite respectful of the humanity that is in that person. And it's, I mean, you, you said that, yeah. you know, um, I'm, I'm aware we're, we're, we're rolling swiftly over the, over the time that I said we'd be. So yeah. I'm going to skip towards my end section, uh, my the same few questions. So I'm not keeping you for too long. Um, so when we're done with this interview, what's the first thing you're going to do this evening? This evening. Um, so I'm going to go and take my dog out for a wee. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's all glamour here, Connor. <laughs> oh, well, it's all glamour everywhere. I have to do the same thing, uh, so it's fine. <laughs> What's your dog called? Uh, my dog is Willow. And Willow. she's driving my boyfriend up the wall in the other room because he's trying to keep her quiet. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of dog is it? Pardon? What sort of dog is it? Uh, she's a cabochon. So tiny little white fluff ball. She's a half, oh. half mm. Cavalier King Charles, half Bichon Freeze. Um, have a shot mm. have a shot yes yeah. um so, uh, what, so what are you gonna do oh you're taking the dog out for a wee yeah 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 it's it, as we said very glamorous uh, <laughs> it's the life of a indie author podcaster <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> uh, do you have any other goals in the future regards uh writing and then any goals that are nothing to do with writing yeah, okay. Uh, a goal to do with writing is that one day I would like to feel like a writer. Um, and I think that probably a lot of writers would say, well, that's what a writer feels like, is that you never feel like sort of authentic. I mean, I, I'm, I, my eye has been caught several times by the, the Hugh Harry um, trilogy to the left of you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's profound, isn't it, how different you imagine writers feel so like you know if i'd written that trilogy a wonderful trilogy which everyone should read um you you would go to bed every night going i'm a great writer i'm i'm really good at writing i have no doubt about my writing ability but i'm sh I, I you know i'd be willing to put words in hugh harry's mouth and say i bet at times he goes oh i can never put another word on a page again because i suck so yeah. awfully yeah yeah um and i, I think that you know, as much, all I've really learned about that sort of feeling of, you know, just being a gross, gross imposter is that the, the very most, that at least that's what everyone else feels like. What a terrible psychological impairment wanting to be a writer is, honestly. No wonder so many of us drink ourselves to death or shoot ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this public service announcement has been brought to you by Andrew Shannon uh, <laughs> and uh, Story of a Storyteller. <laughs> um, Non-work. Um, yeah, not, non-writing goal. Um, I'd like to have the COVID vaccine. Oh, wouldn't we all? <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, and do you know what? Like, just from the point of view, like... I don't know you're not you're not the first person I've interviewed for this season of the podcast that said that was their goal <laughs> really yeah and it's like it's just so that I can shut my brain up about it 
mm. and just get on to thinking about other things. Like, I think that's what everyone feels like is that, you know, I think, I honestly think that's why Donald Trump lost as well, is that everyone just felt like they had uttered the word Trump and written the word Trump and read the word Trump so as many I, times as that they could possibly do and that they'd had a surfeit of it yeah. and wanted something different. And that's how I feel about this year is that I would just like to move on and be able to focus my brain on my next book and, you know, uh, and move on. Yeah. Just move yeah. On. Like it's been a, it's a, been a, I don't think there's a single person in the year that this in the world that this year hasn't affected negatively or been a bit yeah. traumatic. I feel is a very extreme word, and for some people it has been traumatic. But it's it's mm. it's been a slog and it's been difficult, and we all just want to move on. So this is going to be releasing in 2021. So hopefully <laughs> everyone will be listening, going, "Oh yeah, I remember that. That was yeah, that's done." <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna comment under the video and say, "Yeah, I've had my vaccine now." I'm feeling ah, good, 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 good. good. <laughs> Um, my last three questions in the very short and easy is uh, one, where can people find you online and find Man v. Fat and find before and after? OK, so they can find me online. Uh, probably the easiest thing to do is go to uh, my blog, which is helloshan.co.uk. Um, so Shan, S-H-A-N. And um, they can find the book at helpbiscuits.com. And that's H-E-L-P-B-I-S-C-U-I-T-S. I always worry that I'm going to misspell biscuits, but it's just biscuits. Healthbiscuits.com. And that should take you to the Amazon store for your geographic location. And uh, Man v. Fat is just manvfat.com. Perfect. Brilliant. Um, um, my last question, I said three, but I actually can't count. Um, okay. <laughs> my last question is, what was the last book you read? Um, I'm current. well, I'm going to... Uh, skip the last one that I read because it's embarrassingly awful. I tend to read, um, you know, I, I struggle with when I'm writing, I tend to read things that I could never even dream of writing. Okay. So I read a lot of detective fiction um, because, I, I, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to write a detective book because they're so intricate and you have to be really quite sort of, you know, it's like building a, um, a clock or something, you know, just yeah. all of those cogs fitting together. And it's only when a master does it that you see how perfectly they all interlink. And um, so I read, uh, I think it was a Sarah Paretsky, uh, the Ivor Shorsky book I just finished, uh, but I am reading Under the Dome by Stephen King. Very good, very good. You read it? Uh, no, I haven't read it, but I, I, it's, I feel like I have two to be read lists. One is all the books in the world and the other one is all Stephen King's books which I feel are an equal amount because um, yeah. <laughs> I don't like understand how that man can but like I've read I've read his book on writing so I do understand how he writes so much but I don't understand how he writes so much <laughs> yeah I mean prolific doesn't even begin to cover it and also they're, they're like serious chunky books as well yeah yeah exactly it's it's yeah it's, it's, it's when you're, you're reading it on Kindle and you're constantly turning pages and you're like I'm from 12% to like 13 percent over three hours yeah How long is this book? and then you see that when it was first released it was released as like eight paperback books yeah <laughs> it's 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 not it's impressive but it's not yes uh andrew it's been a real pleasure having you on and uh thank you so Very much sweet. i feel like we could talk for two three more hours easily and we wouldn't be running out of topics so i must get you on again in the future oh no so, yeah. oh there you are you're back God. Yeah, the, the, so the video is obviously conking out because we've been talking too long but yeah, yeah. Connor it's, it's been great talking to you too and thanks ever so much for having me on